Well, good day, everybody. Welcome to uh, Faith Seeking Understanding, and uh, welcome to our monthly series, Calmly Considered, with uh, myself, Alan Bevere. I am uh, the self-appointed Anselm Chair of Podcast Theology and Culture at Faith Seeking Understanding University, where all seekers are welcome to ponder profound things for free and as uh, this is our third episode, monthly episode, and of course, my conversation partner is Michael Cruz. How are you, Michael, today? I'm doing fine. Nice to see you again. Good to see you. And you, uh, you, you and I, uh, last Sunday, your beloved Chiefs played my beloved Browns and uh, yeah. didn't quite end it as I hoped, but um, I was very pleased with the Browns performance. And, you know, as I said to somebody you can't give Patrick Mahomes any any mistakes because he'll capitalize exactly. on them. And so when, yep. when Chubb's, Chubb fund, fumbled and then we muffed that punt, I said, okay, well, yeah. You know, so, but they looked good. Yes, uh, the, the, the the offense in particular looked good. Uh, yeah. I suspect we could see another game between these two. I suspect the- we could. I suspect we could. I noticed that the odds makers uh, for this coming Sunday were playing the Texans and uh, – the Texans won and we lost, but the odds makers don't seem to think that none of that's convincing because I think we're 10 point favorites or 12 yeah. point favorites. So we'll see. But anyway, it was fun. It was a fun yeah. game to watch. It, it was. was it was a very exciting game. Yeah. It was excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, let's turn to the let's turn to the real important issues at hand. So our topic today is race in America. And that has been that has been um a um a Big topic within, I'd say, the last six, seven years. And I'm going to begin quickly, Michael, with just a little story here of my own experience. Back in the early 90s, I was doing a lot of work uh, on generations, generational trends, uh, things like that. Uh, I, I, I did come to see some a lot of that as being too overblown, but it was just interesting to trace generational trends and things happening in the culture. And I remember that just about everybody I was reading at that time uh, and that were talking about uh, these kinds of issues and demographics, demographics was a part of this, was saying that the next major crisis that would consume the American people would be coming in about 30 years and it would be about race Mm. to a person. And so here we are, 30 years. Yeah, and I would say race is probably front and center, wouldn't you? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's the center much of it. Yes. Yeah. So let's have so let's let's begin with some history. Let's talk about that. I mean, I don't think I don't think you have to be a, a PhD in American history to know that race has been an issue from the beginning. Uh, when the first slaves were brought forward in 1617, right? Uh, that came to Virginia. And of course, we we had slavery. We went through a civil war, and then we went through uh, Jim Crow laws, trying to find ways to, to discriminate uh, in the South, trying to find ways to discriminate uh, anyway, and to maintain a white uh, a white control, white supremacist control in the South. North uh, North certainly also had its issues, and continues to have its issues. So. What would you, how would you characterize the impact of race in American history to where we are today? Mm, wow. Uh, I, to me, as I look back over American history, I think I see three eras, us living in that third era and probably coming to a crisis point within that, that third era. And uh, as I look back at the time from the, the first uh, white Europeans coming to America and the slavery that existed up until 1865, being the era of slavery, uh, where um, black Americans were treated as property. They, they weren't even, they were subhuman. And uh, that persisted, what, 200 years, something like that. Then we come to the period post-slavery up until the 1960s, the Jim Crow era, where it's no longer slavery, but it's basically democracy for white people and totalitarianism for black people. And black people are second-class citizens. They're technically citizens. If you look back at the history of Jim Crow laws and things like vagrancy laws, where you had to prove that you had a job beginning of each year. And if you 
were not employed, you could be arrested. And of course, if you're arrested and you're imprisoned, then you lose your rights. And basically you're subjected back to the whole issues of, of working for the man. And, uh, the, and I won't need to unpack all that. We could spend days going through all the, the details of that. But it was basically keeping blacks and whites separated. Those are the primary, I mean, there were certainly other uh, ethnic groups uh, that have suffered racism as well. Um, but then we come, I think, to the era that's post 1960s. And I think I would call it white hegemony. The idea that we no longer talk in explicitly racist terms, but the idea that the natural of order of things should be uh, white guys largely in control of the system. Yeah, we got a few women here. We got some black folks over there and some Hispanics folks here, and that's okay as long as they're at the edges and as long as they largely endorse sort of that white hegemony that exists in society. And I think where we are at now. Um, in recent uh, years, we now know that more than 50% of children under 18 years old are not white. Uh, the population, the demographics are rapidly changing, and it's becoming and harder to harder to keep playing like this kind of inequality and, and the discrimination, either I say discrimination, it's not necessarily even intentional, talk about systemic racism that, it, that exists in society. It, it's harder and harder to pretend that those don't exist. As, as the the numbers become bigger and the voices are there. So I guess I would say that that's how I sort of look at, at where we have come and that we're coming to a crisis point where these issues have to be addressed. There's a, a, a couple of books that I have always felt very helpful over recent years. One was um, called When Affirmative Action Was White uh, that talks about the development during the Jim Crow era of the the New Deal laws and how those were specifically designed to exclude African Americans, and you see some of that develop. But then also uh, Michelle Alexander's book, *The New Jim Crow*, where she talks about mass incarceration in the period going from the 1980s up to the present, and how that has stigmatized uh, Black Americans, particularly Black men, as criminal. That uh, we had slaves, then we had second-class citizens. Now we have criminals. That's that's the way we tend to view uh, people that are Black. So I, I think we are evolving. Uh, it feels like three steps forward, two steps back uh, on some of this. And I'm just talking about Black Americans here so far as all I've been talking about. There's also the issue of this, uh, Native Americans with uh, people from uh, Latin America that have settled here, that type of thing as well. But I mean, we could go into great detail. So I, I, that, that's kind of how I view the history of where things have been evolving. Yeah, I like that. That's that's very, very helpful. And and one of the things, of course, I think that we're in right now is uh, a segment of the white population in denial that we've got something embedded and systemic. They don't deny that there's racism. They don't deny that at all. But when they think of racism, they think of the KKK. Uh, they think of uh, what specifically white supremacists. Um, but they don't see anything embedded or systemic. They, they deny yeah. that that's the case. Right. Um, but I think, I, I mean, and, and by the way, let me say that 20 years ago, that's where I would, that's where I was. If you would have okay. asked me 20 years ago about racism, that's what I would have said to you. I would have said, yeah, there's racism out there. It's terrible. Uh, we, we, you know, we can't give these people a platform. Uh, but as far as the systemic issues, no, it's, it's not, it really is not an embedded problem. I have come to change my mind on that, and I credit, uh, first and foremost, my African-American students that yeah. I taught over the years in graduate school uh, who helped me to see that. And and I, I would start when I was teaching Christian ethics, and of course, at some point you talk about race. I, I would, when I got to that, that, that class, I, instead of talking, lecturing on race, right. I would see my African-American students talk to me. Talk to right. me about race, and and I'm I'm going to listen. The only thing, I, the only time you'll hear me speak is I'm going to ask questions. But I, otherwise, I'm just going to listen to you, and I let them talk. And yeah. you know, uh, they were they consistently were telling stories. Yeah, how racism is embedded in the culture, and and that you know, and what that means is what that means is that 
those of us who are white have unacknowledged presumptions or assumptions and we act on those. So, um, so a quick story I'll tell you in reference to that is um, when I was before, before I came to the church I'm in now, I was in a, I was in a downtown setting in an urban setting and we did a lot of ministry to the poor and the homeless and dealt with, uh, uh, it was ethnically diverse. So it was, it was um, uh, black, white, Asian, Latino, but I still, I can remember, I remember having a conversation with an attorney in that city who defended uh, and did a lot of pro bono work. And he would tell me, he would say, I, I, when I, and he was, he was a white attorney. He said, when I get an African-American uh, client, I coach him very differently about how to be in court sure. from, from a white uh, 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 defendant because, because there are those unacknowledged embedded assumptions about minority uh, persons who have been accused. And so I even coach them about how not to wear their hair and how not to talk and, <laughs> and just the whole bit, because I know that, that they will be judged negatively by this. Right. So I never forgot that this is because this is an example of the embeddedness of it in the culture. Right. right. Yeah, I, the analogy that or the expression I like is the idea of the birdcage. I don't know if you've heard this analogy before. I think it's a sociologist talking about how racism works uh, in America. Um, if you think of a birdcage, it's made up of multiple wires that, that are in the cage to keep the bird confined. And if you look at any one of those wires, it's easy to analyze that wire and say, well, why is that such a big obstacle? Why should that be such a big problem? I mean, people can overcome that. People overcome similar things all the times in their lives. And they're right about that particular wire, but it isn't just one wire. The cage isn't made of one wire. It's made of all of these wires of various things that all put together is what creates the birdcage. And I think that that's the issue with racism individual acts by people who are are uh, what do I want to say are truly racist is one maybe one wire out of dozens in the birdcage of things that people deal with so it's part of it by no means explains it all most and I were having this conversation I don't know a week or two ago I was, I was reflecting that going back to the Jim Crow era and you talked about the GI Bill of Rights uh, my dad is a World War II veteran. He was drafted in July of 1945. So he was the very tail end of the war, but he had all those GI benefits. And when he came back uh, uh, out of this, the military service after two years, he had that GI Bill and went straight into college. And the GI Bill helped him pay for, for his tuition. And then he went on to get a master's degree after that, worked for a petroleum company and went on to get a PhD, took the time from that to get a PhD. And um, later in his career, he left that corporate work and went into teaching, became a professor for a while. It took a little bit of a cut and pay to do that. But he went to a college and became a professor there. And because of that, I was able to get tuition free for yeah. college because he was there. Was there anything wrong in what happened with anything that I said there? Was there anything particularly toward or you know, bad about that? Um, did was somebody harmed because of what we did? No, I, I don't think so. But if you look at John Doe, who was a black man, who was born at the same time my father was, and he served in World War II, and then he decided to go to college afterwards. Well, first of all, he couldn't go to any of the prominent colleges in the South at all, period, because it was segregation. Most of the black colleges were focused on preaching, education, that type of thing. So getting, it was a very narrow range of fields that he would have been able to get a quality education. Colleges in the North, I saw one interview from Princeton students back around 1948 or something like that said that, I think it was 60% um, of the students felt that, there sh that Blacks should be allowed to enroll at Princeton, but the majority of those felt that there should be a quota. There should be a maximum number of, of Blacks that be allowed to, to attend school there. 
So even if you go to some of these schools, if you went to the, even the black schools in the South, you had segregated towns with limited accommodations. So if you went to school there and you have this influx of people after World War II trying to, you know, where are you going to go to, to live if you go to these schools? And to make my point is, Joe, John Doe, very few of those John Doe's went on to get that college education the way that my dad and so many others did so effortlessly. And what was the impact for their children? in terms of their children thinking about going to college and the earnings and the the status and the connections with people and all the types of things that are involved with that. Now, I didn't do any of that. I didn't, I didn't perpetrate that on anyone, but that was in the system of things as they were. And those consequences are being felt by you and me and Black friends that are our age we're being felt by that today, and it continues to extend on down. And so I can I can point to multiples example. I just want to give a very personal, specific one, but I come back to that's still just one wire in the birdcage, <laughs> and, right. and and there are so many others of these wires, and that doesn't even get to the explicit things and the the things in the criminal justice system about the way people are treated in the criminal justice system today. Um, I, I read an article. Uh, about a woman in Indianapolis uh, just a few months ago. She was trying to get her home appraised, black woman. She knew her home had to be worth over $200,000 based on what she'd seen in other houses. And so she got an appraisal and the appraisal came back at like $110,000. So she got a second appraisal. It was $125,000 and she just knew this couldn't be right. So she had a white male friend that she asked if he would show the house to the, to the appraiser and she took out any indication, any pictures, anything of her family that would indicate who she was and that she was black. Appraisal came back at two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Yeah, um, that's this year. That's not nineteen forty-eight. Right. And if you know people who are African American, who are people of color, and you talk to them, you have confidence that they can share the truth of their lives to you. This is not uncommon. Yeah. Um, yeah, people. and and it's interesting that this tends to be the majority store kinds of stories with the African American community. I mean, one of the yeah. things in this time uh, that and it, this is a problem uh, that uh, we we have with confirmation bias is um, well, let me begin with let me begin going back. So back back 1994, uh, I think that was O.J. Simpson, right? Yeah, when, right, uh, yeah. And the, the car chase on TV, the Bronco chase. I I, I remember specifically that in polls, uh, when when Black Americans were asked, "Is OJ guilty?" the answer overwhelmingly was no. Yeah. When you asked white Americans, the answer was overwhelmingly overwhelmingly yes. Yeah. Now that and and that what what intrigued me about that poll was had had no bearing on whether OJ Simpson was guilty or not. That was to me right. not an issue. But what is it about the experience of yes. Black Americans in general and white Americans in general that they had such a very different view? Yeah. Um, and, and so one of the things when you look at these, these kinds of issues, you have to look at the overall experience. Right. What, what is happening right now for those white Americans who want to deny these realities they're trotting out the exceptions. They're going, yeah. you know, Candace Owens is one, Larry Elder right now, who's running for governor right. on the recall. And what I'm, I'm not, and I am not saying that their experience doesn't matter, that they should simply be dismissed. They have their stories. I, I'm assumed they're sincere in what they believe, but they are not the norm. Right. And, and this is the one thing I keep trying to say is, you have to ask the question, what is it about the overall experience of African-Americans that overwhelmingly, probably in the 70 percent, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe high as 80, but I'll say 70, yeah. that they're they're not with Candace Owens. They're not with Larry Elder. They they've had they've had other experiences <laughs> right, and, yeah. and you can't dismiss that. Right. Because you can you can always find one or two outliers, and you can find this in anything, right? Any right. subject, race, sure. anything. You could always find the exceptions. The question is, what is the overall uh, trend that you see? And uh, 
in in my conversations with with a couple of hundred or so students over my years, I maybe maybe had one at the most who was an outlier. Everybody had the same, you know, when they talked about uh, their right. encounter with law enforcement. Uh, they talked about, you know, whether you're talking home appraising, like you like you mentioned. Yeah. And so what bothers me is we we really we're we're uncomfortable with this discussion. So we would rather find people who just confirm us instead of really engaging the uncomfortable hard truths. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I think there's also the fact that there is and again, I don't like you. I'm not wanting I don't know Elder and I don't know Owens. I don't know them that well to know, you know, what, what's in their hearts. But I do know that there is also the temptation to um, basically take the views of the dominant group in order to get their approval and order. And that gives you status and position to be able to influence in whatever way you want by having their their blessing. And so um, is that what's going on there as well? I don't know. I don't know these specific individuals. I do know that you can document that 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 is what happens sometimes uh, with people as well. So I think it's easy to get down that, that rabbit hole of, of, of the outliers, like you say, and not look at the overwhelming statistics, the studies that, that show what happens uh, for people of color. Uh, the, the evidence is just overwhelming that, that there is a difference in, uh, for people in society, yeah. Yeah, one of the temptations uh, I, I, is, is the, that we all have, right? All of us have the temptation to, uh, develop cover stories. And these are the stories that help make painful parts of our history a little more acceptable. Right. You know, right. So, so we don't talk about, we don't talk about invasion of, of, uh, uh, of America and displacing the indigenous people. We talk about manifest destiny. Right. right. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, it's the American Revolution, not the not the uh, War of Rebellion. I mean, You're right, yeah, <laughs> coming at it from across the pond, right? Exactly, yeah. Right. So, so and terminology makes a difference, right? I mean, sure. I mean, and I so so let's let's get into this about the uncomfortability. So we got some stuff going on um, in in Texas, uh, in some other states uh, that, like Texas, has um, uh, changed voting laws recently. And uh, Georgia, Arizona, um, I, I'm not sure what uh, um, what some of the folks in Arizona have been inhaling. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but obviously there there's there's voter laws that have been changed. The justification has been to preserve the integrity of the election. Right. But let, let me read you. A, let me just give to you a couple of <laughs> statistics that you know all too well. But let's just do this, and then I'm going to let you respond to this. So, okay. right. so here's. So let's just take Texas. All right. So here's the here's the here's some changes in demographics in Texas. All right. Uh, Texas has the fastest. This is uh, this is from um, this is a this is from the um, PRRI. And uh, oh, yeah, right. Okay, right. Um, and they're they're reputable. Good stuff. Texas right, has right. the fastest growing population in the U.S. with nine Hispanics relocating to the state for every one white person. Yeah. OK. Uh, the. Uh, the what's the other one I want to say that uh, I said that about the Hispanics. Um, and the other thing is, is that minority voters, while they cannot, while they don't all universally vote Democrat, um, they do tend to vote Democrat. Okay? Right. Um, and then let's talk about uh, the changes of elections. Uh, Ted Cruz, his first run for Senate, he won by, um, and I had the numbers here, I don't know where they went, but I think, I want to say he won by like 12, 13 points, percentage yeah. points. He was okay. reelected uh, by three, right? Points. And and by the way, you can this goes down the this goes down the board. So obviously things are afoot in Texas that are changing. <laughs> All right, with that in mind, Michael, what's yes. going on with the voting laws in Texas? 
Well, and I, I, th I don't think it's just Texas, but there's several other states. Yeah, I too. wanted I wanted to focus yeah. on Texas because I had yeah. these numbers, but that, we could think right. about Georgia as well. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think if you look at, I think the the other question, the other issue to bring in there is that this is about supposedly voter integrity, voting integrity. Where is the evidence that there was anything wrong with the the election? There isn't any. There's nothing that that was untoward or you know you can't say that there was absolutely no irregularities or no fraud but nothing of consequence that would that would affect an election there's always going to be some minor cases here and there so you can never say it's 100 percent, but it's 99.99 percent safe and so what is the issue that they're even trying to address and my i mean i just put my cards on the table there i think this is very clearly people who are frightened by the fact that there is a growing change in the population in the world that is different from the world that they knew yeah. and they can't win it through political uh, debate and persuasion and so now you're turning to uh tried and true methods of the past of voter suppression yeah. of trying to to lock people out and if i if i could just uh divert for a second there one of the whole things with the mass incarceration thing that's happened over the last 30 years is that if you get a felony, and in many states, uh, certain other, you commit certain other crimes, you lose your right to vote. And if you don't have, um, even once you're out of prison and you uh, technically could have the right to vote in some states, there are certain penalties that you have to pay, court fees and all that type of stuff in order to get your right to vote back. And by the time the person's out, and free, the last thing they want to do is get back engaged with the the, uh, the legal system. And so you have literally, and particularly among Black Americans, you have this unusually high percentage of people who are denied the franchise anyway because, they, uh, because of that. So this is a tried and true method of trying to suppress vote among the people that you don't want to vote. And so in Texas, all I see is them trying to, to raise obstacles to the wrong type of people voting uh, that, that they want that I don't know how to define it in any other way. Yeah, I agree with that. I just don't because and, and I understand I understand that you have got uh, people who have bought into this idea that the election was rigged and all of that. And, yeah. Uh, but but the reality is everybody who was close to the election in every state, Democrat and Republican. Right. That this was one of the most secure elections in history. And, and if you if there was a problem and it could and you wanted to deal with it, there's a method for doing that. It's called taking it to the courts and having it rectified. And nobody was able to present one iota yeah. of credible evidence that anything untoward happened anywhere in, in these states. So right. yeah. yeah. So something so, somewhere would turn up if it was that massive a fraud. Yeah. So so in a sense, what we're what's what's going on here is another is an, another attempt in a long line of attempts to systemically uh, yeah. discriminate uh, right. by making laws that you know are going to hurt tend to hurt minority voters or tend to make it more difficult for minority voters right and and not white voters right and of course that's that's the beauty of <laughs> the beauty that that is the beauty of uh, the way racism has worked in for most of our lifetimes is that in slavery it's very clear what what the status was in Jim Crow the people that were implementing Jim Crow made no bones about the, their racist intents of keeping separate separate because black people were not as important. Now we've moved into this thing where we know we never explicitly say what what our intentions are. Oh, look, well, we're just going to uh, not have as many drop off points and we'll not do them on certain days and we'll, you know, do this, that and the other. And see, I didn't say anything racist. I didn't say this was targeted to anybody. But when you look at the consequences, it's pretty clear what the what the aim is. Yeah. 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 And my concern is that in the short run, it's going to have it may have a, a deleterious effect on our elections. I think in the long run, with the way demographics uh, are going. 2055, the predictions are by 2055, there will be no discernible ethnic majority. Right. So this this will not last forever. But well, in the short term, I have some concerns. Yeah, I think I think it's actually probably going to happen sooner than that. When you look at uh, white fertility, the rate at which yes. white people are having children, 
versus, I mean, that just continues to drop off the table. And so if they're not replacing themselves, meanwhile, people of color continue to have birth rates at, at normal and <laughs> replacement rates. Right. Uh, I, I think it could be even sooner, but I think you're right. I think that that's, it's interesting you mentioned that because I think 20 years, 25 years down the road, I, I think some of this, I, I think a lot of this will have, have worked its way out. But what happens in these next 10 years, I don't know, maybe a little bit longer. I think that's where there's all sorts of possibility for some pretty bad stuff to happen. Yeah. yeah and we already can see in California what's going on with the playbook there. Larry Elder's already yep. suggesting that if he doesn't win, it's voter fraud. Exactly. So this is going to be the, the mantra is going to be if we win, fair election. If we lose, it's right. obviously voter fraud. And right. that's going to create some real headaches in the meantime. Right. Exactly. Because it becomes a system where it becomes a system where you are always you are always right. You, right. And that talking about rigging the system, that's rigging. You know, right. If I win the election, it's fair. You win the election, there's right. fraud. And well, and, well, and that's that is the the basic playbook of authoritarianism. Yes. In, any institution that I don't have control of that doesn't bow to my wishes is automatically corrupt, suspect, evil, so on and so forth. But once I have control of it and I have my people in there, you must obey and give complete honor and support without question and you know honor whatever my institution says must be done. Yeah. I mean, that's that's authoritarianism. And that's, that's basically what these groups no, are turning. It's real interesting. The last time I was in Cuba before COVID, my yeah. Christian friends in Cuba are, are conservative. They're, they're socially yeah. conservative. Yeah. They're conservative but man they they know they they've got they've sniffed out trump <laughs> the they know course. this guy oh, because yeah. they know authoritarians they've lived right. with authoritarians right yeah. the Castro, right and they know how they operate and they know how they talk and right. and so they they they've got trump they got trump figured out down there oh yeah experience well, anybody um, who's read in, they've had the experience you don't even necessarily have to have that level of experience you just read about how these people work and how, what, how the thought press works, you know, the, the idea of, of lying about everything in order to confuse the public so that the institutions are constantly in turmoil and can't hold you accountable. Yeah. That's how, that's how you get your authoritarian power is by, by paralyzing everything that might actually hold you accountable. Yeah. And that's, that's what this whole thing is aimed that's at. Thing is. Um, I, I, one of the memes that I've seen sometimes in social media uh, when someone posts, uh, I, I miss the America I grew up in. And I've always yeah, said yeah. that's cover language for I miss, and, and the people that post it don't know this, they don't acknowledge it. And they would say, right. But, but what it means is I miss the America where white people are in charge and minorities just happily go along. And I didn't have to deal with all this. And I didn't yeah. have to deal with all this. Yeah. And, yep. and so that's really what, what is going on and what is unacknowledged. Um, let's, Let's uh, talk then a little bit in connection with uh, this. And uh, last week, was it last week, the last uh, Confederate statue uh, on Monument Avenue in Richmond, uh, which I don't know if you've ever been down Monument Avenue. Uh, I have. One. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, lots of statues of Confederate generals and, and heroes of the Confederacy. Uh, they have all been removed um, now that the statue of Robert E. Lee was the last one to be removed. Uh, we've got uh, people who have argued this is this is what we should do. Uh, others who have said this is an example of cancel culture and they're erasing history, this, that, or the other. What's your response to that? Oh, boy. I think monuments are not necessarily about the past. Monuments right. are about the future. And the reason you put monuments up is because they remind you of some virtue or some value or some belief that you want to carry forward in the future and to have other people aspire to accomplish that virtue or, the, or that, that um, ethic. What is the purpose of having the leader of the military who rebelled against the United States government with a group of, who was rebelling on behalf of a group of people who explicitly identified 
that the American Constitution was flawed in its language that all men are created equal and that they were going to create a society that was based on the truth that all men are not created equal and preserve slavery. So what is the purpose of commemorating someone who was the leader, the military leader of the organization that was attempting to create that kind of world? There are people like Thomas Jefferson who are complicated people who had wrote some great words, um, was a great uh, philosopher, thinker, uh, politician, who at one hand, you read some of his stuff, you would think he would be somebody who'd be about liberating slaves, and yet he held slaves all through his entire life. He's a complicated person. But we don't generally honor Thomas Jefferson because of his views on slavery and because of what he was doing. We, we, we lift up that aspect about um, liberty and freedom that, that he wrote so clearly about and was able to attempt to shrine with clay feet into a written document and to be able to, to, uh, to create a path forward for us into a, a better world. And so I think that that to me is the issue when you begin to look at some of these monuments. There are no monuments to perfect people because there are no perfect people. But the question is, what is the purpose of the monuments? And if you'll go back and look at the history of when most of these monuments were erected, they weren't erected in 1870 or 1875. They're erected about 50 years after the Civil War, right at the time of the, the revival of the Ku Klux Klan, of the implementation, the thorough implementation of segregation and Jim Crow, the idea of the Lost Cause, uh, Confederate women's organization trying to whitewash, literally, uh, whitewash history. And so they are telling a false history, as it were, about our American past of what's going on. Take those statues, put them in a museum. Yeah. Well, let's let's have them where 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 we where they are uh, available for our discussion and reflection in terms of what they meant in our American history. But they have no business being in places of prominence and honor, and uh, places where we would normally place things that uh, inspire us uh, to 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 the virtues of the things those statues represent. Yeah. And so that's yeah. that's how I would distinguish it. I think that's a great I you know, it's it, it we we can't forget the history of the Confederacy and what happened. But right. we don't have to commemorate it. And that exactly. be the difference. And I agree with you. In fact, I'd be all for if somebody in Virginia wanted to donate a whole bunch of land to put these statues in an outdoor museum where people could go and see them, but have them put in the context of why why they were put there in the first place. And right. really deal with it uh, from the perspective of, of remembering. I like your I like your comment about monuments are, are about the future. You know, and you mentioned Jefferson. Uh, I saw an interview. Uh, I don't know all that long ago. Uh, Annette Gordon Reed. I don't know if you know it, that name, but Annette Gordon Reed is an African American uh, scholar. I think she teaches at Yale. She's a Jefferson scholar. Okay. And, written books on Sally Hemings and all of that. And she was asked that right. question, should right. we take down Jefferson monuments? And her answer was no. Uh, and precisely for basically what you said is that, yes, he owned slaves. We don't want to commemorate that. In fact, we want to tell the story of that. And if exactly. you go to the you will be told the story of Sally right. Hemings and slavery. Uh, but we remember him because he made a larger contribution that we deem worthy to remember that uh, he wrote the Declaration of Independence. He wrote, you know, uh, he founded the University of Virginia. So in other words, he was complicated. He was greatly flawed. Um, he, and interestingly enough, uh, she pointed out, not, and then this is another thing how we kind of cover up history. He's, of course, early in his life as a young man, he's talking about slavery and it's an abomination. We got to get rid of it and we got to somehow figure this out. But later on, there comes a point where he completely stops talking about slavery altogether. Right. And her contention is it's when Jefferson realized how much money he could make in buying yeah. slaves. And yeah. once he realized yeah. that, because he was because everything else he was losing money at. But once he yeah. found out he could make money buying and selling <laughs> slaves, he stopped talking about yeah. the sin of slavery. Right. Yeah. But, right. But we're right. We're right to remember his contributions. Right. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is, if it wasn't for the Civil War, 
uh, Robert E. Lee would not be known to us, except maybe a footnote here or there. Right. Same right. thing is with Stonewall Jackson and all yeah. the other uh, heroes of the Confederacy. They Their claim to fame is that they led a rebellion against the United States of Mer America for the purpose of keeping other human beings in bondage. Exactly. Yeah. Precisely. And so why would we commemorate that? Right. And right. You know, as, as you all, I'm sure you know, Germany, you can't put a statue of Hitler anywhere. Right. But they sure remember the history. And in fact, every every German school child at some point is required to visit a concentration camp. Right. Yeah. So they exactly. they've not forgotten the history, but they're not going to put a statue of Adolf Hitler in the square. Right. Yeah. And, and let's be clear too that in the United States, the the wave of these the erection of these monuments to these Confederate people happened at two specific times. It hasn't been just a, a slow accretion of developing monuments over a period of time. The two biggest times were in the 19 teens into the 1920s when we had the surge of Jim Crow and racism uh, emerging in America. And the idea was to resurrect the idea of the lost cause. And the second big one was in the 1950s going into the 1960s. But what did we have then? The civil rights movement. And that's you, so at both times you had the erection of these Confederate movements that were in response to changes that were happening uh, for Black Americans uh, in, in society. So, do you, do you also think that part of the motivation for the, uh, the, the erection of those monuments was a way to say to Black Americans living in the South, you're it's still a white man's world? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't have any question about that. Yeah, it, it's it's that white hegemony thing. Yeah. So we, we still, so we're not going to say that we're racist and we probably genuinely believe that we're not racist, but we still in the back of our minds have this idea that somehow it's supposed to be uh, white guys. And, and I literally mean guys, white guys that are supposed to be in charge of what's happening in the world. Yeah. And while we may not consciously perceive that, we perceive that the world is changing and that we're losing that status. And that goes back to something I think mentioned, uh, you were asking about this earlier on. And I, I think if you look back all the way to the 1670s, there was a slave rebellion uh, that was joined with uh, slaves and poor whites that attempted to overthrow plantation owners in Virginia. And that was put down. They, they were not successful. And what plantation owners began to realize from that point forward was that if they gave certain privileges and uh, treatment to the poor whites, that would keep them divided from those from the slaves who they might find common cause with. And so they would be reluctant to rebel because they would lose whatever minimal status they had if they joined with blacks. And I think that that has persisted on down through the years, this idea that um, my status as a white person is somehow dependent on there being somebody below or beneath me that I can look down on and, and see as lesser than I am. At least I'm not them. Um, I, I think there's, there's that attitude. And I think that that still persists in some quarters of society. And I think that that is what terrifies uh, many people, although they may not be able to consciously articulate what I just said. I think that that's part of what terrifies the sense of losing an order in which they had identity and they had a purpose in a particular way and they will no longer have that the society changes yeah so what is it that we fear i mean the order you talk about that um, mm -hmm. but what, what are some of the other things that would be the unacknowledged angst of white americans at the fact that we are not going to be in the majority much longer I don't know. What do you think? What, what, what are your, I mean, I, I got some, I, yes, I, 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 I think, well, I, I think there's a fear that maybe if we're the minority, we'll get some of the same things back at us that we gave to others. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, now I, then that could happen. I mean, you know, we don't want to be naive about human, right. Human corruption when it comes to power and authority and influence. Yeah. But maybe we're just afraid that, that, you know, we will have less, we won't have the opportunity. We will end up being uh, the John Doe that you talked about. Yeah. It, and, and an African-American will be your, your father. Who right, right. Benefit. They're, They're going to get the special privileges. Yeah. 
Yeah. But to which I just say that's just part of the continued uh, one of the reasons we need to uh, be willing to have conversation and dialogue and build relationships is is that kind of conversation. Um, right. And right now, what what's happening is, you know, uh, shutting down the conversation. So and not wanting to deal with it. Let's talk critical race theory for a minute, because I've right. got to do that. OK, uh, critical race theory is one of those things that, uh, you know, you know, uh, politicians have and politicians on both parties do this. When you're opposed to something, you've got to find a boogeyman. You've got to find right. something you can point to. Uh, you and I talked about this in our last episode with socialism. Right. You just got right. to be able to use that word. Right. Conservatives have used the L word, the liberal word. And, uh, you know, liberals do it, too. But so so and so that's critical race theory. So one of the things that uh, people uh, use to criticize uh, critical race theory is the issue of its connections to Marxism. Yeah. Now, what's your what is your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, there, there's Marxism yeah. and then what I would call Marxian uh, uh, thinking in terms about how to how to approach a topic. Right. And so in sociology, you talked about there were used to call them the conflict theory school of of, uh, of looking at things. And there was the idea that there was the structural functionalist school in, in sociology. So structural functionalists intend to look at how all the pieces of society exist together, how they all coordinate, how they work and how they create stability and how the whole thing functions almost like a an organism. In fact, that was one branch of that school was sort of this organic uh, society. And of course, the problem with that is that if everything is about everything functioning in uh, harmony and, and fine tune, there is always conflict in society. So where does conflict come from? And it doesn't often doesn't explain that well. Conflict theory comes more from the idea that there are groups of people with various statuses in society who have common interests together. And those common interests tend to pit them against others uh, in other groups in society because they have competing uh, and conflicting interests in what happens. And the idea there is to look through that lens to see how who holds the power, how they go about maintaining power and keeping power, how those without power are kept without power, that type of thing. But it often doesn't explain well then if everything is about conflict and all these these battles going on, how is the society continues to function through, you know, through time? So it's it's to me, it's not that it's one or the other. These are different lenses through which you look. And in fact, one article I was reading sometime back said that critical critical race theory is not a noun. It's a verb. Yeah. It's, it's a way of of looking at a problem. And there you can look at, at five critical race theorists people who are using that lens, and they all may have very different perspectives on what's actually going on in terms of how the pieces interrelate. So I think that that's, that's how I look at the critical race theory. The way it's being used in politics now is that anything that uh, defines racism as other than a particular individual taking a particular prejudice act, then if it's not that, then that's critical race theory, and it's wrong, and it's evil. Um, and it's all because of communists and Marxists that are they're doing it. I, I guess I, I should back up and say I didn't make the explicit connection. So critical race, uh, critical uh, conflict theory in sociology comes from Marxist Marxian analysis. Marx right. was the idea who had the idea that there are various classes and how could you look at that? And so it's often described as Marxian, but it is not Marxist in right. terms of being a particular political ideology that somebody is trying to um, to voice upon society. It's a lens through which to look. Yeah. Yeah. Leave it to a politician to uh, take uh, take something that uh, is helpful and turn it into something. Yeah. I. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, th this this topic is so important to me and it is so hard to, because it is so complex and the birdcage is so huge and there are so many wires in it. You, I, I, I just often feel like we are going around the edges of it and never really getting to the topic. And I, I think one of the pieces 
that has to occur is the idea that all of us have value. And, the, and, the, and I think it's particularly poignant that for African-Americans in these recent years, the idea that black lives matter, that, that, that saying that is the idea that they, they don't exist, that they, they feel they don't exist, that there is indifference to the situation that they're in. And slavery and Jim Crow, they existed. And, we, and there was a very clear statement as to who they were. Now we want them to disappear. Yeah. That, that's, that's what they want. And until you have a culture that recognizes that all of us genuinely do matter and that we're willing to listen to the people that have been left out of that where everybody matters, then we're never going to get to the end of this. We may, we may solve the mass incarceration problem, but we're going to come up with some new twisted way of, of demeaning people that are, that are in minorities. And so I guess the, the thing that I come is, is what's the answer to that? And it seems to me that it has to be in institutions like the church is ones that help create the narrative that everybody matters, that all are included, and that we're all part of the beloved community. And that requires listening and learning and, and, and hearing people's stories and sharing those and responding accordingly. And unfortunately, when I look at polls and I look at how people respond to topics, I think on balance, the churches, its institutions have been in the role of enforcing and reinforcing the problem and not being the solution. I and I, I think that that's, that's, as I look forward getting to the last third of my life, I look at what does that mean now and, and how do we do that? Yeah. No, I, that, that uh, greatly distresses me. And, and um, because it is, again, as I've continued to say, is, is that Christians in America see their faith through the lens of their politics. Right. Uh, conservatives do this, liberals do this. And frankly, their politics is more determinative than, than their uh, religious perspective, faith, faith perspective. And that, that actually gets gets shifted based on what they already believe about their politics. You know, one of the things, uh, you know, well, and by the way, when you talk about the church on that, and I agree with you, uh, the church has to lead the way on this. One of the ways we have to lead the way is by naming really what the sin of racism is. Exactly. And that's what's really uncomfortable for people because the truth of the matter is, this is not just about a few bad apples who don't like people with other kind of skin color. This is an right. indefinite embedded problem and the fact that it has been part of our history since the beginning right um, 16 and 19 16 17 whatever it is yeah, not 1776 yeah. right yeah uh, it's been there since the beginning it should not be a surprise really think about it with that long history that we would have embedded systemic problems with race that this just yeah. makes sense and that we need to be able to name it and we need to be able to have that conversation. Um, so, Michael, you know, we are in some ways, we do seem to be talking past each other. On yeah. Some of this. I mean, what do you have any thoughts as to how we can frame the conversation that at least we could uh, maybe have the conversation? And by the way, there's going to be uh, extremists on the fringe who, you know, I'm not going to waste my time talking with them because yeah. they know what they know. And right. no amount of evidence will, you know, they know what they know and they, they know right. no one else does because they watched a YouTube video. I'm, you know, I'm, right. not, I'm not interested in really conversing with those folks, but right. there are people who I think would be willing to engage in dialogue. I mean, are we sometimes using some of the wrong language? Is there some language, some different language we need to use? I mean, so let me give another example real quick. Right. Um, um, Black Lives Matter, right? Right. Yeah. To say Black Lives Matter is not to say only Black Lives Matter. It's to say right. in the past, in our history, Black lives have not mattered as much as white lives. And right. all we're saying is they should matter as much. Right. As exactly. right. But now we've got, and I find this interesting, is that we've got people now responding saying, well, we shouldn't see race. We shouldn't see color. We shouldn't see that. Right. I want to ask my white friends who say this, where have you been? Yeah. Um, uh, when, when throughout our entire history, we've been seeing color and we right. have based a lot of our, our laws and a lot of our culture and society on color. And now 
that we really are having to confront it in a way we never had before, you want to dismiss it by saying, well, we all shouldn't see color. Well, right. here's the reality. If we want to get to a society where we don't see color, at least in the interim, we have to see it now. Right. To talk about being race blind yeah. while you're in a race conscious culture yeah. is to be participating in that racism. That, that's, that's the issue. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you've got to be, um, you do want everyone to be treated equally and be treated uh, with, with respect and dignity. Yeah. But the fact is, not everybody is. And right. to continue act, just act like you don't see that. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, I, I guess the question, one of the questions I was going to ask you, as I've been thinking about this, because we're talking about um, systemic racism, and I've, I've heard some conservative uh, pastors and thinkers talking about, you know, the Bible only addresses, you know, this idea of personal sin and repentance. And if we all just were to, re, you know, repent of our, our racist attitudes, that would solve the problem. As a, as a theologian, it does, the, does not the Bible address the idea that there are generational systemic issues that have to be addressed? I mean, the Bible is not only uh, concerned with the corporate sin of the people, it's concerned that even individual sin has corporate consequences. Right. So you do have this notion about the sins of the fathers being visited to the generations. And I say, if you don't think that's true, just look at America. This, yeah. I've said this to students over the years. If you don't think that that's actually true, just look at what's happened. We are still paying the price for the sin of slavery. Yeah. We're still doing that. Um, the second thing is, um, you know, King David, uh, King David's uh, little, uh, well, we call it adultery, I call it abuse, his abuse of yeah. Bathsheba, and then conspiring to have her husband killed. What does Nathan say to David? Because you have done this, you know what's going to happen? The sword will not depart from your house. Uh, what does that mean? That has implications for the people down right. through the decades, and down through the centuries. So this idea that the Bible only deals with individual personal sin, you can only have that view. And, and I know conservative pastors are, are, are pushing this, but you can only have that view if you are, uh, if you embrace enlightenment liberalism. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and there is a reason why there's a reason why many theologians and philosophers have argued that conservative modern conservatism and Modern liberalism are just two sides of the same enlightenment modernist coin. So right. if you're going to make the argument that the Bible only talks about personal individualized sin and not systemic sin, first of all, you've not only misread the Bible, but right. second, you have become you have become a modern liberal. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I, I I just find the whole thing so bizarre, but it I think it bizarre. it just speaks to the depth of denialism, of fear of um, our degree of discomfort as, as white Americans to be able to look the, fair, the thing squarely in the face and, and to have conversations about it. I, 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 there's a, I think I mentioned in this book last time uh, that talking about, it has nothing to do with this topic, but it, it's uh, how the church fails business people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he talks about there where he's talking about how business people have to confront how their faith interacts with their work world and he talks about the church being a place that creates a space for courageous conversations. Yes. And I, I think that is one of the roles that I think the church is going to have to adopt more aggressively, uh, yes. rather than just being the, what, the church that does all the great programs and has the great sermon on Sunday and, and all those nice things that all make us feel warm and comfy and, and fuzzy warm inside. Uh, someplace there has to be the space for these courageous conversations for us to wrestle with this stuff. I, I think, uh, like you said, I don't know about the immediate future, but I think over the extended future, maybe by the time we get to the end of my life, maybe by the time we get to the lives of kids and, and grandkids, um, I think the changing demographics of the country and the fact that people will increasingly be forced to come into contact with people who are of, of different cultures and races. And I even think in recent years, Melissa and I have commented on this, and it seems to me, I, I think it's probably been developing over time, but particularly in the past four or five years, just watching television, 
And we try to avoid programs where we have to watch commercials. But when there are commercials, I, I'm just struck at how many of the commercials that you see very rarely a commercial that has only white people in it. And a great many of the people that are depicted are mixed uh, race couples, uh, that type of thing. And to me, that's just so positive. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, creating the images of what's normal and, and, and what should be in the world. And I, I just, I have this hope. I hope it's not misplaced, but I have this hope that as our society becomes more diverse ethnically, that more of these conversations will be forced to happen. Uh, my hope would be that it would be the church that would be leading the conversation and helping that develop rather than being dragged kicking and screaming into it. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I know, and I understand that pastors have to sort of be careful how they navigate. Oh yeah. It can be done. And because I've yeah. done it. We, right. had, um, we had a conversation not too long after George Floyd, we did a group that was among a couple of different churches. Uh, right. With white fragility. And we met, it was all zoom because we still were meeting online. Uh, and I don't know, we had uh, a dozen or so people read it. Some people were not comfortable, didn't like it. Of course, they weren't required to be there. Didn't right. know, I think the church should delve into that stuff. But my response was, no, you can't read. You can't. I, I've always said that if the Bible talks about a topic, it's fair game. Right. And so, you know, and I've also said uh, we get people in the pews who say we want we we believe in the whole Bible. And I say, you know what? You really don't want me to preach on the whole Bible. <laughs> I preached on some of these texts about yeah. immigration and asylum and about greed and the poor and other stuff. And some of these other texts, you really would not be very comfortable. Right. So, but but you can have these conversations without a pastor holding hostages on Sunday morning in a sermon on it. Exactly. Right. I, yeah. I find that's not the best place in our context to address those things anyway. Right. But in a conversational type manner where people can respond, where we all can wrestle together in a, in a place where there's civility and, and conversation, we need to have those conversations. You know, I uh, posted something, just a quick note there on this, to relate to what you just said about courageous conversations. I, I posted something last week, I think it was on the Confederate, on taking down the Lee statue. And I posted in several clergy Facebook groups I'm a part of. Uh -huh. And I posted that what I what I had written, and I asked the question, clergy, tell me how you have how you have addressed uh, the issue of race in your church, if you have, and if you have not addressed it, why not? I did not get one single response. Yeah, right. Now and again, I want to say to my fellow clergy, I understand this is not an easy topic. Yeah. But the Bible, uh, you know. Uh, when I look at those who led uh, uh, the, the uh, people of God, they did a lots of they did lots of stuff that wasn't easy. Right. So we must have these courageous conversations, and we can do it, and we can do it right. Right. Um, but we have to have the strength uh, of, of our own courage to be able to do it and initiate it. Right. I think one of the things that I've been going back to that. Uh, I thought about several times in just the recent years, past four or five years. If you look at, I, I went through this period about 20 years ago, of looking at the whole idea of church development, redevelopment, how, you know, working with congregations that are in declining uh, state and how do you go about re-energizing and, and getting them going. And it was one of the, the things I was reading was talking about this whole idea of, of innovation. And how does innovation occur? And you've seen the, the, the bell curve that they have where there's the leading edge adopters and then the, the later adopters, you know, finally you get to the point where you get more than 50% on board and some of the laggards, you know, come along. But I think always assumed in that, in at least in the, the church stuff that we talked about, was that some of those people that were on the tail end of that bell curve were never going to come along. And the idea was you would help them find some other place, you know, where they can connect and belong. And so, and I got thinking about that from a church situation, but I think the same thing probably also applies to, an, to a nation that as the change occurs, there's the early adopters, there's the people who are coming along. I feel like there's momentum. It's not moving fast enough, strong enough in my estimation in terms of what I want to see, but there's movement. At some point, it's going to get beyond that 50%. Maybe it's already there. Maybe that's about where it's at. And you get beyond that and things begin to push in a good direction. 
But the issue is that there's always going to be some people who are never going to get on board with that. But in the case of a nation, they have nowhere to go. They're still going to be here among us. And I think that that's one of the things that we have to get used to in terms of speaking the truth and trying to deal with change in our culture is to recognize that there are always going to be detractors. There are always going to be people who are going to be stuck against us no matter what happens. And I, I've talked with enough pastors to know that a lot of pastors have that shepherd's heart that they need to bring everybody along, bring the whole flock along together, all in one big mass and you know, move them from point A to point B. And that never happens. <laughs> That's well, just my favorite words. Say, I kind of lost that, that aspect of a shepherd's heart a long time ago. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you just know yeah. you're never going to bring everybody along. Right. Uh, yeah. you, you would hope for that, but that's not the way that it works. But you know yeah. something, there is change happening, Michael. The very fact that we're yeah, talking there is. very fast, yeah. that we've seen, we have seen uh, Richmond, Virginia, take apart a Monument Avenue. The very right. fact that my Cleveland Indians have Chief gotten Ray. rid of Chief Wahoo and will change their name next season to the Guardians. If the you Guardians. 10 years ago, would that be changed in my lifetime? I would have told you no. Yeah. Look at what's happened and how these things, and, and by the way, that thing, that had to happen. I mean, I yeah. Mean, um, you know, and um, real quickly, are, are, is there anything with the Chiefs on that? I mean, or is, that's, is that a different animal? Uh, I don't like the name the Chiefs. I wish, I wish they'd get rid of it. They have eliminated most of the, I think, things that would have been clearly offensive in terms of that had to do with the whole Chiefs background. Yeah. Um, the, the, the one that still just annoys the daylights out of me is the whole tomahawk chop thing that they do, you know, oh, yeah, you know yeah. that, that stuff they borrowed from the Braves 30 yeah. years ago, whenever it was, yeah. um, I wish they would do away with that. Um, there are, uh, was it the Florida Seminoles? I think it is that has yes. this, the, this agreement that they reached with the Seminole, uh, uh nation, they, they paid them naming rights to be able to use that that name and then they consult with them about how the seminal Im uh, image is depicted and that type of thing where you work out a relationship um is that possible with something about for the chiefs i don't know um yeah i mean chief I, is, I mean it, no, i mean chief wahoo was, was clearly a racist symbol yeah, a right racist character. right and then the indian's name goes along with that but chiefs is a little bit of a it's not it's not quite clear it's it's not quite so um, so yeah so clearly offensive but why are we dealing with a name that's at the edge? Well, <laughs> that's that, a that, 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 so, yeah. and for me, it's like I, I wish I wish they would go with another name uh, yeah. to do that. But we take it one step at a time yeah. um, and, and yeah. do what we can. And so I, I do feel like there's good positive things that are happening in society that are that are happening in culture but there's an awful lot of ugly stuff here and i i i worry over the next five to ten years you know what's going to happen but i do think that over the long term we get past this and i think people i i think your children and grandchildren i think w when they get older they will look back on this era of what has happened much like we looked back in the 1920s when the Klan was marching in the street or when we had um uh, you know, some, some of these past eras, McCarthyism, you know, I think that that's how this era is going to be viewed uh, when we yeah. get beyond these next, the next decade or so. Yeah, I, but, I will, I've thought about that too. And I think to myself, you know, when my, my, well, my children are grown now, but my grandchildren who are very young right now. Yeah. I want to live my life in this in such a way so that when they look back at this era, that they're not embarrassed by me. Exactly. The positions I took. Yes, uh, I don't want to be that embarrassment, and and uh, I'm afraid there are going to be there are going to be uh, adult grandchildren, you know, 30, 40 years from now who are going to be embarrassed at some yeah. of history, as, as far as how they oppose some of these things that really are not. So let let's address one other issue before we close this out in relationship to this. We talk about the chief sure. change name. You know, there's there's a group of people that will say, oh, you know, everybody's being sensitive, oversensitive, and we're being snowflakes. And you know, I had a I had a social media friend who posted a uh, uh, a meme pictures of uh, Archie Bunker and other shows of the '70s, and said, this is the reason we're not offended by anything today. In which I pointed out to him, uh, I said, actually, uh, 
conservatives were extremely offended by Norman Lear. Back yes, in they the were. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. they felt like he was lampooning Republicans. And I said, my dad was one of them, you know, yeah. who wouldn't watch right. any of that stuff. So, so right. you know, we do tend to kind of um, uh, smooth over the wrinkles and forget. Exactly. But what do you say right. to somebody who says, this is, oh, you know, suck it up, buttercup, quit being a snowflake. What's your response to that? Um. I mean, I want to know the topic we're, you know, we're talking about what, what's being said, but I, I just generally, unless you are a position, unless you are in the position of someone who is on the receiving end of that derogatory statement or the one that lessens your dignity, um, I'm not sure I care much whether you think <laughs> I'm being a buttercup or a snowflake. And I, I think that, that that that's really the issue. And just uh, the, what was the song from the 70s about they will know we are Christians by our love. Yeah. And I, I, one of the lines I always like that and we'll we'll save each man's dignity and save each man's pride. Yeah. Just, just the idea that as a Christian, that should be our default, that that's what we're looking out to do uh, to to save each person's dignity, to save each person's pride yeah. and uh, to just be cavalierly. Uh, doing things and saying things that are hurtful uh, to other people uh, is the antithesis of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. As I as I have said to a couple of my uh, white friends on this, to say, you know, when they start saying, "Well, this is not this, and this is not that," I say to them, "You do realize you're doing what I like to call white splaining." Yeah. You know? You know how you have mansplaining when men tell oh, women. Oh, white splaining. Yeah, 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 right. Man, men tell women how they're supposed to think about right. it. Is this exactly what you guys do? You've got you've got a majority of African Americans who who have another story. And right. you are coming and saying, no, 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 that's not really happening to you. Let me right. give you what your story should be. Right? Right. You're white exactly. splaining. And you probably ought to quit it. And because you know, you don't want anybody telling you, Michael how you have to, how you should interpret your experience. No, Michael, that's not really what happened. Right, and, exactly. But we do it because we're uncomfortable. We, we would right. prefer not to have to face the hard truth, which you could argue was kind of being somewhat of a snowflake, I guess, uh, yeah. that you face the hard truth. And so you have to find a way to cover it over. Yeah, exactly. Agreed, yeah. Well, wow, great discussion, lots to think about. And yeah. uh, friends, uh, Thanks for joining hey, us. Hey, yeah. Alan, can I just add one thing? So yes, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned a couple books that to me have been very helpful in thinking about this topic. And one of them was When Affirmative Action Was White. And I, I, that was a really helpful book. Another book I read a few years after that, which to me some of those things like a sequel, was The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And so if any of your listeners are watching this and they have other books or other articles or topics that they think would be helpful along the lines that we've been talking about. Love to hear what, what things that they- Well, that would be might, great. So let's do a couple of things. Yeah. Michael, if you would send me the links to those books. Okay. I'll post them uh, uh, on, in the description on uh, YouTube, the YouTube channel, and I'll post them the same way with the podcast. Uh, and then listeners, uh, if you've got any topics you think would be valuable for us to converse about, um, we would be glad to do that. So don't hesitate to uh, leave a comment uh, wherever this is posted or to uh, send an email uh, to either one of us. And uh, we would be glad to take that under advisement, Michael. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right, friends. So we're uh, we're done for the day. Uh, we will come back with our October episode, uh, subject to be determined. Uh, but we uh, will have another wonderful hour of conversation, which I've enjoyed so much. So uh, Michael Cruz is my conversation partner. I'm Alan Bevere, and uh, the patron saint of, of Faith Seeking Understanding University is Anselm of Canterbury who said, I do not seek to understand that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. So keep seeking, my friends. Everybody have a good day.